word. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. I extend the present Sabbath to all those who are listening, who are connected to this presentation, this program by the Manchester North SDA Church. I'm grateful to Pastor Daniels for allowing me to address his congregation this way. May the Lord bless you, my good pastor, and grant you wisdom from above, that your leadership may take the church, church forward and upward, so that when Christ, many will be ready to receive him as their savior because of the ministry of the Manchester North SDA Church, and may God bless the Adventist Church in the UK. I welcome anyone listening who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you are there, we are particularly delighted to say welcome. We are honored by your presence, and may the Lord grant you a special blessing that will induce you to worship with us again. I extend also a warm welcome to any little boy or little girl who is watching. Little children learn a lot. They learn quietly, they observe, they absorb. And so may the Lord bless all little boys and little girls who are watching. Our subject for today, the word and the speaker. The word and the speaker. Before I jump into that message, let me also welcome all the countries represented by the listening audience. I cannot forget that all countries represented by the listening audience, thank you. May God bless the leaders of those countries in a very special way, particularly, of course, the host country of England. The three favors I ask is that you preserve reverence where you are. I realize we're on this electronic platform and there may be a tendency to be slack and informal and, and casual, but that's not the way God is. God is always a serious God. He's loving, but he's serious and the angels approach him that way. So if possible, and it has to be possible, preserve reverence where you are, monitor your children, let them understand this is a serious act of worship. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I, uh, Jeremiah 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as surely as God lives, I want to speak his words. And favor number three. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. In other words, let's think, let's concentrate, let's ask questions as we listen to the word of God. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for life. We thank you, Father, for freedom of worship. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you this way. It's not our usual way, Father, but it has a distinct advantage in allowing the message to go much further afield than under the normal ways of worship. We thank you that God that Christ's blood still shed for us, still washes away sins. And if we have offended you, dear God, forgive us, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Grant me a special cleansing, dear Father, that I may be a clean vessel used by you for the proclamation of truth, for it is truth alone that sanctifies. I pray for the visitors who are listening, bless them, dear God, touch them in the area of their lives where they need your attention, dear God, and be generous in your blessing of them. Bless the little children, dear God. And if anyone listening has COVID-19, I am asking you, Father, because your word declares you to be a merciful God. Micah 7, 18 says you delight in mercy. Then, Father, just as an act of raw mercy, Heal anyone listening to me now who has the COVID-19. Heal that person, dear God, and let that demonstration of divine mercy draw that person to your bosom. Father, bless every country represented, particularly the host country, 
put upon the leaders, Father, the consciousness that righteousness exalteth a nation. Now, Father, I commit this service to your glory, and I humble myself before you. Use me, I pray. Speak through me, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1, my favorite book. We'll begin with my favorite verse, verse 1 of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This, is, this first verse is not there by accident. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And by God's inspiration through the Spirit, this was placed as verse number one in the entire Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse three now explains how this was done. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called the night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The verse tells us, verse 3, and God said. Clearly then, creation was by the word of God. And I'm very much aware that you all know that. But we need to take a closer look at the word of God, particularly as we live in these very perilous and troubling times of COVID-19 and the hardships that has brought upon us. Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Heaven and earth were made by the word of God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Creation by the word, the maintaining of creation by the word. Second Peter chapter three, reading verse five and verse seven. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We skip to verse 7. But the heaven and the earth, which are now by that same word, are kept in store. In other words, creation is maintained by the word. This makes the word of absolute and highest importance. It is so important that the Bible says in Psalm 138, verse 2, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The word of God, my listening friend, cannot be overstressed. Jesus told Satan, <clears throat> excuse me, in Matthew 4, verse 4, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus calls upon us <clears throat> to live by the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is by the word that we're instructed as to how we should live. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. The simple being the uneducated and people of that description. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Now, light is also life, which means the word of God gives life. Listen to these words from Ellen White, Education, page 15, paragraph 2. No, page 126, paragraph 4. Education, page 126, paragraph 4. Here's what she says. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. Let me say that again as you concentrate. The creative energy it must be a living energy that creates the creative energy, and that's the very life of God, that call the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. To beget is to give birth to. She tells us the word of God imparts power. This is the very power of God. It begets life. It is a life of God. So when Genesis 1.11 tells us, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, Grass is a living thing. That was done by the word. When the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, that form of life was by the word of God. So whether it's grass in verse 11 of Genesis 1, or land animals, verse 24, 25 of Genesis 1, or the fish and birds, verse 20 and 21 of Genesis 1, all forms of life came into existence by the word of God. 
I go back to Ellen White's quotation, but let me pray again. Father, as I continue, speak through me to God for your glory. Restrain my carnal nature. Give me simplicity and clarity of speech. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Education, page 15, paragraph 2. The, page 126, paragraph 4. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. And you're holding that word in your hand now. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. Pause. What does she mean by the life of the infinite one? Is brought to us by the word. The infinite one, of course, is God. The life of God is in his word. I repeat, the very life of God is mysteriously in his word. That's why the word created all forms of life. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. I continue with Eloite's quotation. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. This is the word of God. Now, why do I say we need the word so urgently? There's a tendency in the human condition to depend on our senses. We evaluate our surroundings with our senses and we make decisions based on our senses. The child of God and our senses are of course, seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, touching. The child of God has a higher sense and that sense is the word of God. Let me explain what I mean. Go with me to John chapter 20, our subject, the word and the speaker. John 20, we shall read from verse 19. John 20, reading from verse 19. I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to finish, but I will not hold you long. I'm looking at the clock that's right in front of me. I will not hold you long, but I need just enough time to get this message across as it was given to me. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father have sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins you remit. They are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, we go to verse 24. In other words, Christ appeared to the disciples. Verse 24 tells us, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. Eyes. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. What is Thomas saying? My senses must provide me with the information I need in order to believe or not believe. And so he's depending on the sense of sight, the sense of, of touch, except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe, verse 25 of John 20. Verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Now, Jesus Christ rebukes Thomas for depending on his senses as the highest level of information. If I don't see, I don't believe. If I don't touch, I don't believe. Jesus said, blessed are they who have not seen, have not touched, perhaps have not heard, but they have believed. Why would they believe? 
because the Bible says that Christ would rise again. You find that in Mark 8, 31 to 33. You find it in Mark 9, 31 to 33. You find it in Mark 10, 33, 34. Jesus said it over and over and over. He said in John 2, verse 19 and 20, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up, meaning I'll come back from the dead. Thomas should have believed thus saith the Lord. So when the disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord, he should have believed without actually having seen God himself. The point I am trying to make, my brothers and sisters, we are living in a time when our senses will deceive us. Our senses will mislead us. And our only anchor of certainty must be thus saith the Lord. Remove that, and you and I have not got a sure platform on which to stand. We must come to the place where well, this was the case in all ages, but particularly in this time when we are on the very verge of the time of trouble such as the world has never seen. The only thing we can absolutely trust is thus saith the Lord. Now, Ella White writes in Testimonies, Volume 7, page 205, paragraph 1, read the Bible and regard it as the voice of God speaking directly to you. I pause for that to sink in. Testimonies, volume 7, page 205, paragraph 1. Read the Bible and regard it as God, the voice of God speaking directly to you. Now, I'm stressing this as I continue with the word and the speaker. There seems to be, in my observation, based on what I, the text I get from people from all over the world, there's a growing uh, tendency towards trusting dreams. People dream this and they dream that and they dream that. And is God talking to me? Let me tell you very clearly and directly. When God wants to talk to you, he talks to you through his word. Now, let me also say, God can do whatever he wants. It is not outside the realm of possibility for God to send an isolated dream to someone. But do not believe that God will communicate with his church largely by dreams. He will not bypass his word and the lesser light which is given specifically to this church. When we ignore the Bible, ignore the writings of God's servant, then we have to depend on some other source of information and we look to dreams and visions and whatever else that's related. We must look to the word of God. Thus said the Lord is our only hope, our only anchor, our only compass. Now, that the word of God. By the way, if the word created the world, then it is safe to live by the word to truly fit in with the world. And this is something I've said many times. I'll say it again. Since the world was created by the word, living by the word is the only way to fit into the world. I'll say differently. To transgress his law, physical, mental, or moral, is to put oneself out of harmony with the universe to introduce discord, anarchy, and ruin. Education, page 99, paragraph 2. To disobey his commandments, transgress his commandment, physical, mental, or moral, and the commandments are part of the word of God. To disobey the commandments is to disobey the word. That action puts a person out of harmony with the universe. And so I get back to what I said, to live in accordance with God's original will, which he gave to Adam, you and I must live according to God's word. Now that's the word. The word has said to you in Psalm 118 verse six, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Now we're living in very terrible times and the Bible predicted that. Second Timothy chapter three, verse one, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And the Greek word for perilous means difficult and hard to handle. It's the sort of condition that causes men's hearts to fail them for fear, as Jesus said in Matthew 24. Perilous time, we are living in those times. What's our hope? The word of God. What's our comfort? The word of God. It's our only hope as we try to 
negotiate the times in which we live. And so the word of God, that's why Jesus told the devil, as I said earlier, that we are to live by the word. Living means educationally, economically, socially, uh, you name it, professionally, whatever the area of your life or mine, we are to live that by the word of God. We are to interpret events by the word of God. And so the Bible says, the Lord is on my side. Now that was written for you. I will not fear. Let me repeat what I just said. It was written for you. David is dead who wrote that or whoever wrote it. He did not write all the Psalms. It was written for you. And I bring back to your um, consciousness to write the word of Ellen White. Read the Bible as regarded as having at the voice of God speaking directly to you. So when you read Psalm 27 verse 5, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. That was written for you. Now can you believe that? But having said that was written for you, I also say this, all of God's promises are on condition of obedience to him. And so the word that is spoken directly to you, the Lord is on my side, Psalm 118 verse 6, or in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, Psalm 27 verse 5, that word also says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt do no work. That word also says, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse. The foundation of God's promises is obedience to thus said the Lord, obedience to his word. Are you an obedient child of God? Then the promises apply to you and God himself cannot change his word. I repeat, God himself cannot change change his word because God's word expresses who he is. That's the word of God. And I can spend all day on the word of God, but let me go. Our, our title is the word and the speaker. Let's go to the speaker. And that person, of course, is God, is Christ. Before I do that, let me pray again. Father, as I come to this section of the message, be with me today, God. Tell me what to say and how and when. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's look at the speaker. Here's what he says, Joshua chapter one, verse nine. Remember, read the Bible as if it's the voice of God speaking to you. As you read Joshua 1, 9, God is speaking to you. Joshua 1, 9, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now, this promise to Joshua, Joshua is dead. But that verse is not dead. That verse is alive. And that verse applies to anyone who reads it. The Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And in verse 7, it says that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. That word is for you. God is with you. But remember, the foundation of his promises is obedience. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will not leave thee, nor forsake thee. He didn't say, I will stay with you when things are smooth and leave you when they're hazardous. God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Let me give an example of God not leaving his people. Luke 22, we'll read from verse 41. Luke 22 from verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. This is Christ in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed the more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from, from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found him sleeping for sorrow. Now, the Bible says the disciples were sleeping. Jesus had told them, if you read the verse in Matthew, pray with me. He needed support. They all fell asleep. He came to them three times. Each time they were sleeping. What am I trying to say? God sent an angel in verse 43. Why? Because there was no human person to support Christ. When the Bible says, I will not leave you nor forsake you, it also applied to Christ in 
his humanity because Christ met the devil as a human being. He resisted temptation as a human being in your condition and mine. And so as the father sent an angel to Christ in Gethsemane, Luke twenty two forty three, 43, because the disciples were sleeping, God would have preferred to work through the disciples, human beings like Christ. But because they were asleep, they were entirely out of the picture. Sleep is a form of death. They were useless to Christ. God sent an angel. Why? He cannot leave his children alone. If he does, he has lied. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Read verse 12 and verse 13. We're looking at the speaker. We looked at the word. We looked at the speaker. The man who spoke the words we talked about earlier. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 12. And immediately the spirit drives him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered unto him. Notice verse 13. He was in the wilderness. That's Jesus. 40 days tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast. There were no human beings around. Because that's why it tells us when Christ, at the end of the third temptation, Christ collapsed. It was so tough. He collapsed. I believe it's the desire of ages, page 673, paragraph 3. He collapsed on the ground. It was so And Remember, he had fasted 40 days, and the devil came at the end of 40 days. The devil is very strategic in how he chooses the times and the places for our temptation. That's why we have to be careful and avoid places that may make it easy to be tempted. Or people that may make it easy to be tempted. Yes, I said, or people. And so Jesus fainted. There were no human beings in the wilderness. God sent angels, Mark 1, 13. Why am I saying this? Because the speaker of the words we just discussed, he has promised he will not leave us alone. And as he did for Christ, the human Christ, he must be prepared to do for us because God is no respect of persons. And so we read in Luke 22, verse 43, and an angel from heaven came strengthening him. In Mark 1.13, the angels ministered unto him. We have the same account in Matthew chapter 4. And behold, the devil leaveth him, and angels came and ministered unto him. What Christ, what God did for Christ in his humanity, God must do and is prepared to do and is willing to do for you if there are no human agents available. Very often we feel we're all alone. That's, there's no such thing for the Christian as being all alone. You may not see someone with your eyes, but as I said in the earlier part of the message, we don't live, we don't live by sight. We walk by not by sight, but by faith. Second Corinthians 5 verse 7. And this faith is just our response to the word of God. And so while you may not see anyone, because God's word cannot be broken. God will see to it that there is some form of support for you in these times of uncertainty. If that support is not in the form of a human being because none are available, God is duty bound to send an angel to take care of you. The word and the speaker. The speaker is God. The speaker is Christ. When you have the word of God in your heart, when you live by the word of God, you have God. Yes, we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We say that, but we need to understand if we simply believe God is in heaven and that's it, that does not supply us with the assurance that we need. We need to know that while God is in heaven, in another very real sense, God is right with us, and the Bible teaches us that. You're never alone. John 14, verse 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you in the presence of the Spirit. And through the word, Christ is with us. Let me say it again. Through the Spirit and the word, Christ is with us. Let me combine them. Through the Spirit-filled word, Christ dwells in us. John 6, 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. 
the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so the word of God received is tantamount to receiving the spirit of God. And the spirit of God represents both the father and the son. In Romans 8 verse 9, he's called the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. What I'm telling you, when you receive the spirit of God through the word, you have received the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you. A person with that experience is never alone. My listening friend, if you think things are difficult now, they will get worse. For Christ on the cross, his final words were, into thy hand, I commend my spirit. And Ellen White tells us clearly that Christ had no assurance he'd come back from the grave, despite the fact he knew the Father's word. But knowing something that's written and actually facing the crisis is something else. Jesus knew he had come to die. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times he told the Father, get me out of this. But he knew the word. So what I'm saying to you is, knowing the word is one thing. Facing the reality of the word is something else. And on that cross, the only recourse Jesus had was to trust in his father. And the only way he could trust the father was to trust the father's word, which said, thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Psalm 16, 10, he knew that. He went to sleep in that, trusting the father. You and I, from day to day, must learn to trust in God by trusting in his word. The word and the speaker. The word Genesis or Revelation, the speaker, the creator himself. This is where we must stand in these last days. When things go wrong, trust the word of God. When you're persecuted, trust the word of God. When someone in the family has left the faith, trust the word of God. When you pray for that person to come back, trust the word of God. Because this God who wrote this book said, I'm not willing that any should perish. When you've returned your tithe and you're short on money, trust the word of God. Because the word said, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me. With all respect to other religions, Allah, the God of the Muslim, does not ask you to prove him. The God of the Hindus, or the gods of the Hindus, don't ask you to prove them. It is the God of Christianity. The God of heaven and earth, the mighty God of the Sabbath that says to you and to me, test me, prove me. And there's only one way to prove God, and that is to prove him by trusting his word. And so he says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that they may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out the blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That's what the word says. The very word that says, let there be light, is the word that says, if you bring the tithe, I will flood you with blessing to such a degree, you will not have room to receive it all. Because let there be light and there was light is as powerful as bring you all the tithe. I'll bless you beyond your imagination. You're studying God's word. You cannot understand it as you should. The word has a word for you. John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, recommit your life to God. Be prepared to obey what you learn and you will be surprised how God will open your eye. Very often God does not open the eye of the student because he realizes they will not obey what they learn. So one condition for understanding the word of God is a willingness to follow that word and to obey that word. If any man will do his will, John 7, 17, he shall know the doctrine whether I speak of myself or not. And so we have the word and the speaker. The word, it created heaven and earth. The word is the means by which God saves. I'm going back to the word, then I'll close. This is the first Peter 1, verse 23. Let me pray. Father, I'm coming down to the end. I'm asking you, Lord, don't come to the end of your help. Continue to speak through me, dear God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Listen to first Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Physical creation by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. 
spiritual creation by the word of God. James 1.18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. My brothers and sisters, there is no conversion outside of the word of God. There is no sanctification outside of the word of God. There is no perfection of character outside of the word of God. There is no power to resist the devil outside of the word of God. And there is no preparation to see Christ in peace outside of the word of God. Now let me bring the word and the speaker together. Because our subject is the word and the speaker. They're not separate. In some mysterious way, the word is Jesus, who is God. As much as the Father is God, the Son is God. Listen to John, 14, John 1, reading from verse 1. Listen very microscopically. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, that's the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's Christ. How do we know that? Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christ is called the Word. In, a, in the highest possible sense that our finite minds can grasp, the word is Christ and Christ is the word. And Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, Revelation 1, verse 8. He is Alpha and Omega, the alphabet of the Father, whereby he expresses himself. In uh, the Tsar of Ages, page 19, paragraph 2, Ellen White writes, by coming to dwell with us, Christ was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the word of God, God's thought made audible. The very thinking of God is what the life of Christ was all about. His thoughts were made audible. And when we read the Bible, we are reading the very thoughts of Christ or of God. My brothers and sisters, the word is Christ. The word and the speaker, they are one. When Christ comes the second time, Revelation 19, verse 10, the Bible says, and he was clothed in with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. So that when you read, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The very life of Christ, who is the word, is in that promise. The very life of Christ, who is the word, is in that promise. When you read, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Psalm 91. That word is the very life of Christ. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not speaking symbolically. But I do understand when it comes to divine things, human minds cannot fully grasp. But we can grasp enough to know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We can grasp enough to know that the Bible says in 1 John 5 verse 6, the Holy Spirit is truth. We can grasp enough to understand that Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 says, God is the God of truth. And we can grasp enough to know that Jesus said, as I said earlier in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, truth. Another word for truth is word. Because Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word. So in a very real sense, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are present in the word. Now, how can that be on your side and you still panic? We're faced with COVID-19. I understand another wave is coming in different parts of the world. We're relaxing things in the United States. We may be surprised a few weeks from now that we need to go back to restrictions. I don't know. I hope not. All I'm saying to you is, whether it's COVID-19 or COVID-20, your protection is this. If economies fail, God has promised your bread and water shall be sure. If you're sailed by the enemy, no weapon formed against you will prosper. You and I need to understand our mental health in these last days is based upon simple trust in the word of God. Our blood pressure can be reduced by simply trusting the word of God. And I'm no medical doctor, but I'm saying this, you understand what I'm saying. Because when you trust God, without faith it's impossible to please God. It is the foundation of every blessing, trust in the word of God. Let me close by inviting you to resubmit your life to God and to trust his word. Our subject is the word and the speaker. And I concluded by saying they are one. Jesus is the word. 
and Jesus is the speaker of the word. And so the word is a living word, and the life of that word is the very life of Christ. It's the life of God the Father. It's the life of God the Holy Spirit. The word of God. Trust God's word, my listening friend. Obey God's word. And because we're several the Adventists, we have been immeasurably blessed by the writings of Ellen White, an inspired woman, lesser light, by all means, lesser light, pointing to the greater light. But the lesser light was given for a purpose. Let's read it. It helps us to understand the greater light. And let the words of Christ ring in your ear. But he answered and said, Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. May the Lord bless you, my listening friends, as you renew your confidence, your trust, your faith in the word of God. And if there's someone listening who's a, not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you have been associated with us, you've gotten some Bible studies, make a decision to be baptized. Make the decision right where you are. I'm not saying get baptized right now. I'm saying make a decision. A decision is a very powerful thing. It provides some freedom, some release. Make the decision and leave it up to God to make the way clear for you to act on that decision. Let me say that again. Make the decision to be baptized. Then leave it up to God with your cooperation operation to make the way clear for you to act on that decision and finally go under the waters of baptism. Someone listening to me may need to be rebaptized because you have drifted from God, and I mean drifted catastrophically, even though you may still be physically in the church. You've been convicted by the Spirit of God. I need to start all over with God, with the Word, who is the speaker. If that's your conviction, let your pastor know, let someone in authority in the closest church to you know, so that arrangements might be made for you to be rebaptized as 12 disciples were rebaptized in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. The speaker, the word, and the speaker, they're both Jesus Christ, the foundation of our peace in these last days. Let me give you one more verse. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. There is a quality of peace the world can give you. It is very fragile. The peace of God will sustain you through all social, economic, you name it, upheavals in your private life or in your society or in the world at large. The peace of God will have you sleeping through a storm as Jesus slept through that storm on the lake. May God bless you as you submit yourself into the arms of the word and the speaker and combine, that is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the simplicity of the word. The essentials of the gospel are simple. We are to trust your word because without faith, it is absolutely impossible to please you, Father. And there's no faith outside of your word. Father, take the words I've spoken in my weak way and magnified effect on the minds of those who listen. Clarify wherever I was unclear to God that the message may not be lost. Father, again, I pray for all the visitors. I pray for the young boys and girls who listen, and I pray for all the countries connecting, and I pray again that you would heal anyone who has contracted COVID-19. Father, in the name of Jesus, dear God, heal that person because you do not like to see suffering. Let your people live by your word, by every word, not by the the words of this person or that person, but by the words that proceed out of your mouth, and the words that proceeded out of your mouth are in the pages of the Bibles they're holding. Keep us close to your bosom, Father. Save us all when you come without losing one. Father, pronounce a special blessing on Manchester North SDA Church, I pray. Bless the leadership, dear God. Save us when you come, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll now close with hymn number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of the beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and beauty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life.
Pastor Skate, can we ask you to offer a closing prayer, please? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the power within the word. And that's your very life. We thank you for the conviction the spirit may have brought <clears throat> to some who listen. Father, hearing the word is one thing. Living by the word is something else. We have heard. Let us obey. Let us look to your words for guidance, direction, for power, for help, for everything we need, dear God. Because the word ultimately is Christ. And he or she who has Christ has everything. Bless the host church in a very special way, Manchester North SDA Church. Bless all of the churches that connected. Bless all who listen, dear God. Let us not be forgetful of what we heard. Let us meditate on your word. Because a righteous man meditates on the word day and night. Watch over us, Father, wherever we are. Protect us. Be so close to us, dear God, that we become a blessing to others. Sustain us through the ups and downs of life and save us when you come, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone once again, and we like to thank the Lord for speaking to us through Pastor Randy Skeet. What a powerful reminder that ever presence of God's word is always with us, and he abides with us. And we pray that every troubled soul will find comfort. He has not forsaken us. We pray that we will be like a good ground. Our hearts will be like a good ground. We will receive, we understand, and we allow the word of God to bear his fruit in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we like to wish you all uh, a wonderful Sabbath afternoon. We like you to enjoy your meal. And please do join for the Bible study that has been hosted by the uh, district. We'd like to thank everyone, you know, our friends and our uh, believers across Manchester, across United Kingdom, even all from other countries joining us. Uh, may God bless you and richly reward you for your uh, faithfulness. Uh, we like to continue to pray for Pastor Randy Skeet, that God will give him good health and sound mind and mightily use him for his, yes. for his cause. And we pray that he will remain faithful to the calling to preach the pure 
word of God. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath, Happy Sabbath everyone. Thank you, God bless you. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. 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 Happy Sabbath.